The Battle of Yidrang was the first head-to-head -head encounter between the U.S. Army and the North Vietnamese Army. By the end of 1963, the political situation in South Vietnam had deteriorated and the country was in turmoil. The North Vietnamese intensified their penetration into the South Vietnamese region, and the South Vietnamese Army was losing ground. The U.S. decided that military advisors and a small number of special forces could no longer help the South Vietnamese government against the North Vietnamese forces. President Lyndon Baines Johnson approved the Pentagon's plan to send some regular U.S. Army to Vietnam. A new phase of the Vietnam War begins. Since helicopters began service in the U.S. Army at the end of World War II, Pentagon staff had been trying to revolutionize tactics with this weapon. When the Army received the Huey UH-1 helicopter, they were finally able to implement their long-held dream. The elite infantrymen in the helicopters were able to cross the terrain, and the enemy's heavily guarded defenses to penetrate the enemy's weak hinterland, and deliver the killing blow. Just as the American cavalry did in those days, the 11th Division was chosen to experiment with helicopter air assault tactics. The results were so pleasing to the generals that the 11th Division was given a new number. The 1st Cavalry Division. The 1st Cavalry Division was immediately sent to Vietnam to test their new tactics in combat. Meanwhile, as the North Vietnamese Army continued to gain ground in South Vietnam, their appetite grew and with the support of Ho Chi Minh, General Chu Hui Man devised a new plan to capture the city of Po Loi Ko, cut off the vital Highway 19, control of the central highlands of Vietnam, split South Vietnam in half and win the war quickly. Both sides were mobilizing their best troops, and a head-to-head -head confrontation was inevitable. The 1st Cavalry Division arrived in Vietnam, and set up camp at Anh When they first arrived, they gained ground in the early stages of the North Vietnamese attack on Pleiku, first destroying a field hospital, and then, ambushing a reinforcement unit of the North Vietnamese Army, killing nearly 100 North Vietnamese soldiers. The NVA was thwarted by a joint South Vietnamese and American counterattack. They began to retreat to Chu Pong Massif on the Vietnam-Cambodia border, for rest. The 1st Cavalry Division was tasked to search for the retreating North Vietnamese after a few days. U.S. intelligence determined that the North Vietnamese were operating in the area of Chu Pong Massif. Seven airborne assault points were identified, with the 1st Battalion of the 7th Regiment in charge of the X-ray point. Here, the soldiers of the 1st Battalion will be put to the test. At 10.48 a.m., on November 14, 1965, 450 soldiers of the 1st Battalion landed at the X-ray point in Huey helicopters. They were equipped with M16 rifles and M60 machine guns, as well as some M29 mortars. They will also be supported by 105mm howitzers and air power. The landing took place without any attacks and the American soldiers may have speculated that they had missed again, as they had done on previous days, but in fact, they had broken into a North Vietnamese nest. The Lee Drang in the Chu Pong Massif was indeed an important base for NVA, with its numerous barracks, hospitals, and warehouses. Surrounded by mountains, the Lee Drang River provided a good source of water, and was close to the border for assistance, making it an excellent place to rest, and recuperate. It would have been difficult to get close, if not for the helicopter assault tactics used by the U.S. Army. Near Point X-Ray were five battalions of the 33rd and 66th Regiments of the 1st South Division, of the NVA, estimated to be between 2,500 and 3,500 strong, greatly outnumbering the 1st Battalion of the 1st Cavalry Division and putting the Americans at an absolute disadvantage in terms of numbers. These North Vietnamese troops were elite units that had fought in the Dien Bia Phu campaign. The Vietnamese were surprised by the unexpected arrival of the American troops. However, 
with their 120mm howitzer and anti-aircraft battalions, marching along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The pressure of fire on the Americans was greatly reduced, and the helicopters escaped the most deadly threat. Three platoons from B Company were the first to come into contact with NAV. First and second platoons were ordered to chase the fleeing enemy. Second platoon dashed fast, and got further and further away from the bulk of the group, when suddenly a large number of NVA appeared in front of them. And heavy fire pinned second platoon in place, and they were cut off from first battalion. The NVA quickly mobilized several battalions and began to surround the Americans. The 1st Battalion Commander, Lt. Col. Moore, immediately ordered the men to form a ring, and hold the landing field. The unlucky 2nd Platoon was split up and surrounded on the far side. The company tried to get the 1st Platoon to rescue the 2nd Platoon. After a short period of resistance, the 2nd Platoon lost 8 men killed and 13 seriously wounded, and was essential or de combat. When B Company failed to rescue them, it was left to defend itself. With North Vietnamese soldiers everywhere, B Company could only call for artillery support, and engaged in a fierce firefight with the North Vietnamese who came close. At 2.30 p.m., C and D Companies of the 1st Battalion landed at X-Ray. By the time they landed, the area was already under heavy fire from the NVA. One-seventh of the soldiers were already wounded or killed, on landing. These men had to be evacuated from the battlefield by those helicopters. The remaining soldiers were quickly put on the defensive. The Vietnamese had formed an encirclement, putting enormous pressure on the American troops. Fortunately, the US 105mm howitzers, under the guidance of the 1st Battalion, were able to inflict heavy casualties on the North Vietnamese with their accurate fire, preventing them from forming an effective attacking formation. Otherwise, the North Vietnamese soldiers would have probably already destroyed the Americans. The howitzers were maneuvered by Chinook helicopters to their respective positions, as part of the new tactics. At 3 p.m. on the 14th, the North Vietnamese forces ceased their attacks, the first wave of their attack was ineffective because it was rushed, and the North Vietnamese commanders decided to stop and prepare for another attack. The US used this opportunity to evacuate bodies and wounded soldiers by helicopter and replenish ammunition. The company of the 2nd Battalion also came in to reinforce them. Battalion Commander Moore ordered A and B companies to go to the aid of the far separated 2nd Platoon again but the Americans pushed in 70 yards, and were pinned down by heavy Charlie's fire from the hills, and had to retreat. As the night wore on, the 1st Battalion reinforced its lines, while the North Vietnamese tried to harass the Americans with small groups. A few small battles broke out, but all in all, preparations were made for the next day's fierce fighting. At 6.50 a.m. on the 15th, the North Vietnamese, with mortar support, launched a full-scale attack on the Americans. Mortar shells rained down on the American troops from three directions. The North Vietnamese soldiers quickly penetrated to within 100 meters of the American lines, and the thin lines of defense resisted the waves of Vietnamese attacks. The pressure was most intense to the south, where American losses were heavy, and the North Vietnamese were closing in on the 1st Battalion Command Post. Even Battalion Commander Moore's radio man was shot and wounded. Seeing that the line was about to collapse, Moore ordered his air liaison officer, Lieutenant Hastings, to issue a code word for Broken Arrow, signaling that the U.S. Army was in the nick of time. Lieutenant Hastings called in all available support aircraft from South Vietnam, and a large number of F-100 Super Sabres and A-1 Sky Raiders swarmed in, blasting the Vietnamese lines of attack with rockets, high explosives bombs, and napalms.
So chaotic was the fighting that, an F-100's napalm hit Moore's command post, killing several American soldiers. The American troops on the ground were also engaged in close combat, with the incoming North Vietnamese soldiers, and Joseph L. Galloway, a journalist for the United Press, took up his M16 rifle and entered the fray. He was awarded a bronze star for bravery, the first civilian to receive one in Vietnam. The North Vietnamese retreated at 10 a.m. after a combined air and ground response. The Americans received more reinforcements. The 2nd Battalion landed nearby before reaching the X-ray position on foot. Battalion Commander Moore again organized a rescue of B Company 2nd Platoon, this time with fire support, and they managed to rescue the 2nd Platoon, which despite heavy losses, survived the siege with most of its men. At 4 p.m., U.S. Air Force B-52 bombers carpet-bombed North Vietnamese positions to stop another North Vietnamese attack. Despite the heavy U.S. air fire, the night of the 15th saw the North Vietnamese continue to harass the U.S. lines, testing X-ray. The C-130S dropped a large number of flares, lighting up the battlefield as if it were daylight, and four U.S. artillery batteries concentrated their fire on the Vietnamese attacking formations. While the defending B Company had constructed good field fortifications to repel the approaching North Vietnamese. By the time the sunrise, Vietnamese had left a trail of bodies and retreated. Only six Americans had been slightly wounded. The Americans had survived the most critical moment of the battle. At 10.30 a.m. on November 16, the 1st Battalion which had held out for two days, was ordered to withdraw from the battlefield, and together with the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Regiment took over the defense of X-Ray. The U.S. reconnaissance also found North Vietnamese troops moving towards the border, trying to get out of the battlefield. The battle at X-Ray was over. On the 17th, the U.S. Army planned another massive carpet bombing of the X-Ray area to eliminate the North Vietnamese forces from there. The remaining U.S. troops had to evacuate the area on foot to a landing zone codenamed Albany. The soldiers of the 2nd Battalion of the 7th U.S. Regiment were exhausted after 30 hours of sleepless fighting, and their commander was a new and inexperienced officer. The 2nd Battalion's exhausted troops were detected by the North Vietnamese, and two battalions were sent to ambush the Americans. Neither battalion was not engaged in the battle ahead, and both were fully equipped. One battalion set up an L-shaped position on the road, waiting for the Americans to throw themselves into the trap, while the other battalion circled back. The 2nd American Battalion entered the ambush and was suddenly attacked killing and wounding dozens of men in a matter of minutes. Fearing that the Americans would call for air support, the Vietnamese quickly approached the Americans, and a melee broke out between the two sides. In a crisis, the American commander sent planes to bombard the area at very close range and a part of the American 1st Battalion quickly landed in a helicopter to reinforce them. This ambush left 155 dead, and 124 wounded in the 2nd Battalion, while the 1st Battalion was surrounded for three days and only lost 87 men. Over the next two days, the North Vietnamese forces were completely out of the area under American air pressure. The 1st Cavalry Division cleaned up the battlefield, recovered bodies and wounded comrades, and counted the numbers of the North Vietnamese soldiers killed and captured. In total, 305 U.S. troops were killed and 524 wounded during the entire Battle of Y Drang. The U.S. killed a total of 1,037 North Vietnamese soldiers and captured six. However, the North Vietnamese Army claimed that only 208 men were killed and 146 wounded. 
Both sides would always exaggerate the number of kills and conceal their losses. After all, it was the Americans who took control of the battlefield, cleaning it up and counting the dead, and the Vietnamese were the attackers, relying on light infantry to take on the enemy. So it is unreasonable that so few men died in the face of superior American firepower. The battle was the first head-to-head -head encounter between the U.S. Army and NVA, with both sides gaining and losing. For the U.S. Army, the helicopter assault tactics were validated as a revolutionary new method of warfare, and established an important direction for the future development of the U.S. Army. However, the U.S. Army also recognized that helicopter assault troops were light infantry, and that going into enemy territory without adequate intelligence would be a huge risk. For the North Vietnamese Communist forces, the realization that the U.S. was a different army to the French before them, with more firepower and mobility, led the North Vietnamese Communist High Command to abandon the idea of a quick victory and avoid a major head-on battle with the Americans. Instead of using a more flexible and patient strategy, to drag the Americans into the war. The commander of the 1st Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Moore, who went on to become a retired Army General, later collaborated with the aforementioned journalist Joe Galloway on a memoir, named We Were Soldiers Once, and Young, which tells the story of what happened in the Lee Drang. In 2002, actor Mel Gibson starred in a film, based on the book, some of the scenes in this video also refer back to the film. For the most part, the film is a true representation of the war, but there are some errors, such as the opening depiction of the French GM-100 task force being ambushed, with officers wearing Foreign Legion uniforms, when in fact there are no Foreign Legion members in GM-100. The end credits also show a fictional UH-1 helicopter using rockets and a minigun, to cover a counterattack charge by 1st Battalion Commander Moore, when in fact, UH-1 was not yet equipped with rocket nests and miniguns. The film also ignores the part, at the end of the battle where the US 2nd Battalion was ambushed, and suffers heavy losses. That's all for today. Please subscribe to my channel, and see you next time.